You know, but that's one of the great things about acting is that you know, sometimes you'll find yourself working with people who are quite different to you and have different ways of going about things, which Jim most definitely did. And you have to be a team, you know, and that for me is one of the most exciting things about being a part of a film. Given how many films you've made, what a huge success you've had, do you have a kind of shorthand for the films that you want passed on, a particular type of director, a particular genre? What are the, what's the kind of tick um, list that you... No, I don't think so. I think I just always want to be terrified of a role and surprised by it and immediately feel challenged by it or reading something that I think, oh, my God, I could never... I could absolutely never play that part. When I read The Reader, I just went, oh, well... Obviously, that's not me. <laughs> yeah, there's no way I can play this part. In the last probably three to four years, I have definitely found myself saying to my agent, who's in this room, um, <laughs> I love you very much, Dale. <laughs> been with him since I was 15. Um, I've definitely found myself saying, you know, I, I, I want to really play character roles now. I suddenly feel a strong, very strong desire to be fully out of my comfort zone all the time, <laughs> which is, that's a, that's, a big, that's a big deal. You know, those parts are quite difficult to find, actually. Just sort of take us back to the early 90s. You'd done uh, little bits and pieces of TV, but mm. nothing, quite, you know, nothing too notable, mm. a little bit of casualty and a little bit of this, that and the other. Mm. How did you then find yourself on the other side of the world making a film for the young Peter Jackson? Well, I can tell you a great deal about this because I, <laughs> I remember it very, very, very clearly because it was an audition for... Heavenly Creatures, and i just finished my GCSEs. And things moved really suddenly quite quickly. I was sent this script for a film audition, and, um, <clears throat> and my dad's in the room, and he, he'll probably remember this. I remember that we had to drive to pick up the script because I had to go for the audition the next day and it might get lost in the post, and, you know. And I remember saying to Dad, oh, my God, Dad, it's, a, it's an audition for a film. Wow. Oh, my God. Do you, think, do you think, like, I might get it? And he just looked at me and he said, yeah, you will. <laughs> and I remember thinking, that's... Because he, he was trying to tell me about the attitude I needed to have. Because Dad's an actor as well. And, and so I remember thinking, God, that's it, isn't it? I've got to, I've got to absolutely believe that I'm going to get this part. Because so much of it is believing that you will and willing things into existence. And, um, and I do remember thinking, OK, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to... I'm just somehow going to give them no option but to give me this part. And, 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 of course, a part of that is remaining incredibly calm. <laughs> and, um, and I, I yeah, I, I remember trying really hard not to appear to, you know, like, I want this part, you know, trying not to appear too desperate. Um, and then I met Peter and uh, his wonderful partner, Fran Walsh, who co-wrote Heavenly Creatures, and, and I just thought they were... They were they, I just thought they were so lovely. I auditioned. And then they called me back again about two or three weeks later. And then I was called back again. It was just terrifying. And then they sort of made me wait for about two more months. And then I finally got this phone call telling me that I'd, I'd got the part. And I was working at the time in the delicatessen in Reading <laughs> as a part-time <laughs> job, where I think every member of my family has worked at some point. And, uh, and the telephone rang. And I don't know what it was but there was something about the way the telephone rang that day that I went, it's for me. And I knew that it was. I was like, oh, my God. And I stopped. I was literally mid-making sandwich. I'm like... <laughs> and sure enough, the lovely guy, Chris, who used to own the deli, Kate, yes? Phone for you? OK, sorry. I'm just... I'm just sorry. And just left <laughs> this sandwich, ran to the phone. And it was my child agent at the time who said, you clever girl. And I left the sandwich and I left work and I went home on the bus and <laughs> told everybody that I'd got this part. I don't think any of us could really believe it. So I was absolutely happily going to be in episodes of Casualty and maybe a bit of theatre if I was lucky. I mean, that was... I never thought... I never, ever thought outside of that. Okay. I really didn't. The film itself is so stylized, and you're so weird in it. So weird. And did, how? What were you? Eighteen, nineteen? Seventeen. Seventeen. My God. I mean, how much did you did you kind of understand the film he was trying to make? How much did it mirror the sorts of films that you like? There's an interesting thing that happens when you're an actor. People automatically assume that you're a movie buff and you must have seen everything. And really, at that point in my life, I'd seen Annie and Bugsy Malone and Grease lots of times. <laughs> and that was sort of about... Oh, and Santa Claus the movie. Yeah. But I hadn't seen... I hadn't really seen that many films. We didn't get a video player in our house until I think I was about 14. 
What I remember I had done was when I was given the part, I thought, my God, well, who is this Peter Jackson person? And I remember the casting directors, John and Ross Hubbard, saying to me, well, you know, he's done that. He has sort of a cult following. He's made these quite quirky films. But I also knew, because he had told me himself, that this film was a bit of a departure for him. He had said that he had co-written it with Fran, and it's a very special, very famous New Zealand murder story. And so I remember thinking, OK, well, here I am in England. He, how do I start preparing for this? And so I went to the library in Reading, and I thought, well, I'll look up old newspaper articles, which I knew existed. It's a big library in Reading. And I remember my heart was in my mouth, because the murder took place um, uh, in June 1954. And as I think it was June 22nd. And as I'm cranking through the, these pages, you know, it's June the 18th, June the 19th, June the 20th, June the 21st, oh God, I might not find anything. June the 22nd, Parker Hume murder stuff. I'm like, oh my God, it's really there. It's really real. And we wrote about it in this country. And so there was something ignited in me from that moment. Um, and is it distracting when it is based on a true story, like this, as this was? No, I love it. Okay. I, I really do love it. And I think I, and I love, I, I love being in things that are based on a true story, I think probably because of my experience of Heavenly Creatures, which was so life-changing, I cannot even tell you. How confident did you feel? Oh, I didn't feel very confident at all. But I do remember Peter and Fran, it's a funny thing, when you're an English actor and you go into another country, they automatically assume that you are fully trained, you've got some magical qualification that means that you definitely know better than everybody else which I've played on, believe me. <laughs> and so, and so in this moment of being terrified in New Zealand, and they had cast Melanie Linsky, who was 15, she hadn't done really anything at all. And so they very much turned to me and they said, well, you know, Kate's going to look after you, it's fine. I'm thinking, Fuck, am I? <laughs> uh, OK, yes, no, of, co yeah, of course, I'm gonna, of course I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look after you because I really know what I'm doing. Not at all. And, um, and, and in a way, it sort of, it, it forced me to just jump right in there. It was very much a both feet first moment. OK, you guys think I know what I'm doing. I better really pretend I know what I'm doing. Actually, I better really know what I am doing and get ready for this. And there was a lot of direction, yes. I mean, Peter's a, he's a brilliant director like that. He's very, very generous, very experimental, and will absolutely give you all the time you need. And there were lots of scenes for us that were quite hard to film. And sometimes we wouldn't... We, we emotionally would get quite overwhelmed by those scenes. And he was really amazing at... He would actually empty the set and he'd say, OK, can everyone go and have a cup of tea? The next thing you went on to, which, of course, was Sense and Sensibility, mm. Ang Lee is quoted as saying that he was a bit nervous about you because, the, because of the way you had attacked the this role mm. and that he sent you off on all sorts of Tai Chi courses. And he didn't get... send me off anywhere. He bloody well made me do it. He did it with me. <laughs> <laughs> but... I remember at the back lot at Shepparton, he would say, oh, now we do our Tai Chi. <laughs> I'd say, I'm sorry, we're doing, what are we doing? Our Tai Chi. <laughs> OK. Yes, of course we're doing Tai Chi because, of course, I don't know anything and you must know everything. And clearly, I must do Tai Chi in order to get into character. Ang is not a man of great tact, as he will himself admit. And I do remember him saying to me, oh, my God, this was truly one of the most awful moments of my, I think, my whole life. It still is to, to, to date. <laughs> At the end of the first day of filming, he'd barely said anything to me all day. And I thought, God, I'm, I, I mean, maybe I'm just rubbish. And maybe, I, maybe I've just been crap, but he's barely said anything. And, and I remember going to him and saying, so, you know, how, how, was, how was everything? And he went... Ah, uh, you'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you that is exactly what he said. And I went, OK. <laughs> he just wanted to calm me down, to really, really calm me down. And, um, and he did. Yeah, he absolutely did. And then, of course, Titanic. It was a huge moment, of course, in my life. It was a big turning point moment. And, you know, my life, my life did change really overnight. And I remember people saying to me, before the film came out, oh God, what are, how are you going to cope? You know, your life's going to be, you're, you know, how are you going to not change? And I would get, I would feel almost defensive and angry. I'd think, you know, I'm not going to change. What are you talking about? And it truly did overnight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember one day being able to go and buy a newspaper and a pint of milk, no problem. And the next day I actually couldn't get out of the house because of paparazzi. And that was a huge shock. And nothing really prepares you for that. No one really can tell you about what to expect because it's so sort of unknowable and so weird. 
Did yeah. you have any sense that you were of kind of quite what was going on, quite what it could become? No, I have absolutely no idea. I can honestly say I wasn't able to even really enjoy the success of Titanic because it was so frantic. I just loved the script and I loved the part. Um, and, I, and I did love that love story, that relationship between Jack and Rose. I really did. I thought it was amazing. And of course, Leonardo DiCaprio's name had been mentioned as a possible Jack. And, um, and, and I actually read with some, some fairly well-known actors for that role, which was amazing um, and great fun. But I just kept thinking, oh, God, you know, I really hope he does it. I really hope Leo does it. And, um, and you know, lucky for me, he did. And, uh, and it was a ex completely extraordinary experience, but very, very hard, really very hard. So you did Hideous Kinky, you did Holy Smoke. Yes. It's as if you were particularly sort of seeking out small independent pictures. Is that what happened? I don't really know is, is, is the truth of that. I mean, I think um, these were incredible parts to play. I mean, this, you know, Jane Campion was hot off the heels of piano success and and Harvey Keitel, I mean, my God. And, and I had been sent the script and, and you know, it was, it was just clear to me that if I had an opportunity to work with both of those people, I'd be really stupid not to go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and this was an amazing experience um, and, and taught me a really great deal too um, about film acting and working with somebody like Jane, who's very experimental. Um, and Harvey, obviously. Well, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. It's quirky, personified. When you get a role like that, which presumably is that's how it was written, do you then spend time kind of unpicking your own character's oh, journey? And you cannot it... imagine. It was like hieroglyphics, because sometimes, for those of you who've seen the film, you know, there are, there are memories that are being erased, and sometimes we're in the memory as it's erasing, and sometimes they're memories that are they're, they're, they're either Clementine's memories and sometimes they're Joel's. I mean, it's absolutely, it was all over the map. So, I mean, I think we were always permanently just ever so slightly confused with exactly how this story was really going to be told. But when I was asked to play that part, I sort of, I, I kind of couldn't believe it because I hadn't played any parts like that at all at that point. I really hadn't. I mean, she was Clementine, you know, she was this extraordinary, eccentric, bonkers, balmy, glorious, you know, person who, 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 who absolutely had her own rule book. And nothing I had done up until that point really made me feel as though it would warrant a director thinking that I would be right for that part. And so I remember feeling tremendously flattered that Michelle Gondry wanted me for that role. The most incredible thing about this film is how romantic it is. I mean, yeah. it's one of the yeah. most romantic films I've ever seen. Yes. Which is very unusual, considering it's the pairing of you and Jim Carrey. Mm. How confident did you feel that there was going to be a chemistry there? I don't know, looking back, I think I just felt really excited to work with somebody who I never would imagine I'd work with. I mean, he was absolutely, you know, he was Ace Ventura. I mean, he was, he was from a different, he was the mask. I mean, he was a different genre of filmmaking to me entirely. And, um, you know, but that's one of the great things about acting is that, you know, sometimes you'll find yourself working with people who are quite different to you and have different ways of going about things, which Jim most definitely did. And you have to be a team, you know, and that for me is one of the most exciting things about being a part of a film is the teamwork that involves everybody. There's no hierarchy. I mean, I can't, I have to sort of stamp all that out, you know, by making sure that I know the, you know, the name of all the crew members and, you know, really joining in and sometimes low budget films, you know, helping carry equipment. I mean, truly, you know, and, 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 and then little by little, that sort of, oh, they're the actors, the untouchable actors, you know, gradually you can kind of break it down and then you are all in it together. And ultimately it makes the working environment not only much more fun to be in, but it means that people really are excited to come to work and, and, and people bring their best when they're looking forward to being there. It makes a big difference. And, and Eternal Sunshine did it definitely taught me that because that was it was proper team effort. Let's talk about Revolutionary Road. Okay, yeah. Which is a film that came from a novel that you found that you decided you wanted to you thought it had cinematic potential. I had read the book, and um, uh, which you know I, I I don't get time to be honest with you to read many novels. I just don't because often when I'm reading it's either bedtime stories or scripts, <laughs> and. Um, um, and I read the I read the novel. God, this is absolutely amazing. And then very quickly heard that someone had done a loose draft of it. And then we were living in New York at the time, and a very dear friend of Sam Mendes, a woman named Cynthia O'Neill, um, she had 
come over for coffee or something, and I said, oh, God, Sin, I just read this absolutely amazing book, um, and someone's written a sort of an, a spec script for it, and uh, I just, I've got to find out, you know, who owns the rights, and she went, my darling, I do. <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, well, uh, yes, I do. I said, hang on, hang on, <laughs> stop. She said, explain yourself. And, um, uh, her husband was a man named Patrick O'Neill, who had bought the rights in a poker game from Richard Yates for a dollar. He, he, he ended up buying them for a dollar because he lost everything in this game. You wouldn't believe and that it, if it was in a movie. I know. Anyway, so he had these rights and he bequeathed them to Cynthia in his will when he passed away. She went, yeah, they're mine. <laughs> I said, well, can I have them? And she went, sure. And I remember sitting down and, um, you know, having big meetings with the producer about who was going to direct it and who would play Frank. And, and it was amazing to be a part of all of that and, uh, and to convince Sam to do it. And, um, and then subsequently Leo, which was my biggest coup yet, I tell you. <laughs> I was, yeah, because he, he can be a bit of a monkey to pin down and, um, and yeah. Had you seen it as a very sort of cinematic piece? It strikes me as being incredibly cinematic when I read it on the page. Well, I like... don't have a very cinematic brain, to be honest. I mean, I'm not very good at imagining how a film will look. I can only really imagine playing the part or what a scene should feel like. Mm. But in terms of visually, I'm not really... I don't really have that. I can do that with, you know, home decor, but I can't really do it... <laughs> I can't really do it with, um, with films. Um, but I just knew it was an, ex you know, it was an extraordinary story of about mar about a marriage, um, and and I did feel that Leo and I would find something together that was both on the page and not on the page at all, and I was quite excited by that. And the strange thing about this, of course, is that you found yourself competing with yourself on at awards time because back to back, oh my God, you made the reader. I know. And so, apart from the, the kind of emotional level of it, there is also there's quite a technical challenge with this film, because you not only had to age four decades, I think, during, yeah, yeah. but also you had a kind of accent challenge, because, of course, yeah. you were an English speaker doing a German accent, while mm. most of the cast were German speakers doing English accents. With any accent, really, it's, you, you can't sort of learn an accent and then apply it to the part. You can, you, it's sort of you learn it within the whole process. And so, so I mean, all of Hannah was to me, it had to be sort of how she sounded initially. Mm. I think and it sort of helped me kind of hide behind the fact that I was playing this awful person. Um, there was a brilliant dialect coach who just sort of designed the German that we all did because we didn't want any this and that, nothing really strong. And I started working with William Ross Conacher, who is a fantastic British dialect coach, and Susan Hegarty, who I owe so much to. It was an amazing um, experience with her, of the two of us really figuring out this dialect together. Um, We're going to talk about the dressmaker. I love the fact that it was that it was a comedy. I mean, mm -hmm. it is essentially a dark comedy, and and this wonderful role, Tilly. You know, she's really quite complicated, um, and on the surface appears quite strong, but actually she isn't. There's huge vulnerability there, and lots of sacrifice and sadness in her. And um, and I just I just I just knew I wanted to throw myself at something that was quite different to a, to everything that I'd done for mm. a, for a very very long time. Let's come up today and talk about the other film that you have out at the moment which of course is Steve Jobs working with Danny Boyle. This again is based on a real team of people and yep. you got to meet your character. She's a very warm woman and actually meeting her after reading the script several times it was so crucial because it really did have a big impact on 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 the closeness the physical closeness that we were allowed to have you know there's moments when she links his arm or she throws her arm around him or there's a hug or there's a something there's a there are no there's no there's no boundary there. There's no barrier between Joanna and, and Steve. And, and that came from the time that I spent with Joanna and the stories that she shared and her enormous affection for Steve and admiration. And, and, and she, she loves him still now, misses him greatly. Um, and they remain very, very good friends um, for the rest of Steve's life. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I felt I really, I really did need to be, actually, m more than anything, respectful of the of the relationship between her and Steve um, and really, really honouring it as much as we could. And um, you've talked in a couple of interviews about how technically challenging this film was and how you felt that you really understood how filmmaking worked as a result of making this. Yeah. Was that specifically to do with accent or dialogue? I mean, the Sorkin dialogue is extraordinary. Well, 
The Sorkin dialogue is an absolute bitch because <laughs> there's just so flipping much of it. I mean, it was 187 pages long, this script, which is really is unusual. You know, normally a film script at its absolute longest will be maybe 132 pages or something. So this was pretty extreme. But it moved at this unbelievable pace. I had been told it was written in three acts. I had been told that Danny Boyle was going to rehearse each act like a play. We were all going to learn it. Everyone would then shoot one act at a time and go back into the rehearsal room between those shooting periods as well. And it just sounded extraordinary. It just sounded so, so different. A proper acting challenge, properly spending time with the other actors um, and working with Danny Boyle, which, you know, the idea of which was, you know, so thrilling to me. And working with Michael, God, I mean, Michael Fassbender, oh, he, you know, every day he really, he really took my breath away because he had, it doesn't matter how much I had to do or Seth had to do or Jeff had to do, he had, he was on every single page, every single page of 187 pages. I said in my introduction that you are very much uh, full of press attention. Everybody kind of, you know, twists your words every five seconds. If it's not about weight, it's about vulgar gender pay gaps. Oh, yeah, can I set that one straight? Can, OK, course. so the gender pay gap thing. Jennifer Lawrence is amazing for speaking up, and I think that any, anyone in this industry, particularly women, if there's something strongly that they feel isn't working for them or if they're being discriminated against in any way, shape or form, it's very, very important to speak up. And so I fully applaud that. What I have a problem with is that there's a separate thing that has started happening, is that the lid has been somewhat lifted for journalists. And so journalists on red carpets will now say, so how do you feel about the gender pay gap? What, 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 what's, what's the specific question? Well, do you know whether you got paid less or more than Michael Fassbender? That question? That, to me, is not very nice. I'm not going to have that conversation with a friend or even a family member, let alone in public. And so what's happened as a result of these big, very important discussions is that we're then subjected to a particular line of questioning that being a Brit strikes me as being a little bit vulgar. You know, why, <laughs> why, why, would, I, why would I stand on a red carpet and talk about how much I get paid? You know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a primary school teacher, you know? Um, so I, it's, yeah, it's a difficult one for me, that, you know? Kate, okay, right at the beginning, you talked about uh, not being particularly confident at the first, in the first performance that you gave. Mm. Now, all those films later, do you recognise when you've done something good? I'm thinking specifically of Steve Jobs, in fact, which I think is the most incredible performance. Do you look at yourself and think, OK, that, that time, I got it that time? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe occasionally, sometimes, sort of. Do you have a favourite among them all? A favourite character? Well, yeah, a favourite role. Think a favourite performance you've given. I am quite proud of the reader because it was just so flipping hard. Um, it really, it, it, yeah. And I remember I got, and I'm not a fan of this, but I got very thin making the film. I remember turning up to Cornwall. Do you remember, Mum? I turned up after finished filming and I walked down the lane and Mum went, oh, my God. And really, I, I, I really had shrunk. And I hadn't even noticed. It just, it was a properly, you know, stressful, all-consuming, you know, sometimes quite unpleasant experience playing that part. Um, so I probably, just because it was so difficult, I probably have to say that one. Well, yeah. I'm sorry to take you back to that gruelling time. Well, thank you but, very much. But, Kate Winslet, this has been so wonderful. Thank, <laughs> thank you so you. much. <laughs> Kate Winslet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. I think what I would honestly say to people starting out, you know, it is difficult. It is definitely a hard job to do, and, and you do have to keep working at it. You do have to keep practicing things. You have to allow yourself to make mistakes, you know, make them, rehearse in your bedroom. Try not to look in the mirror too much, because then you can, you rehearse a scene in front of a mirror, and you like the way you've said something or done something, and all you will do is keep picturing yourself doing it the way you liked, rather than being completely present in the moment. No looking in mirrors, that's not good.